The KR-10 radar is one of the newest pieces of equipment being used by state troopers to catch speeders. Tracking beams travel at 186,000 miles per second, or the speed of light, which means they can virtually detect a vehicle's speed in almost no time. In addition, the KR-10 sounds off a tone, telling the trooper how fast an object is moving. But if there are so many cars and trucks on the road at the same time, the radar couldn't possibly single out one vehicle. That's when a trooper must depend on his vision to point out the violator. Authorities say the new radar does not automatically lock in the miles per hour a speeder is traveling like the older radars, and that's the beauty of the KR-10. If he has a locking system or alarm system on there, something to warn him, uh, the instrument is actually clocking a car, not the operator. So the courts feel very strong on this, that, that to have a visual perception of the oncoming vehicle uh, is far better than being warned by a mechanical device. At about $1,400 per radar, troopers feel the KR-10 is a good investment for the department. Some 100 troopers now have the radars in their cars. Authorities are trained and ready to use the device on Oklahoma highways. Ed Stewart, Action 4. When she sings it, she means it. Dottie West truly was raised on country sunshine, about 70 miles from Nashville, as a matter of fact. But Dottie says the whole world is her home, and she'll prove that to a sold-out symphony crowd tonight in Oklahoma City. Dottie is a country and western singer all the way, with only a few crossover pop hits. But symphony music is a world away from country. How does she like it? Oh, I love it. That's the real plush, the real... Elegant, the real, oh, that's the, uh, that's the most, you know, getting to sing with my band plus all of the strings and everything. This isn't Dottie West's first trip to Oklahoma City. She's been here many times and says it's the same every time she comes. No kidding, it really is um, uh, a sweeter place to me. I've always loved coming here because I have friends here and I've played here many times, in fact, in this auditorium. Dan Slocum, Action 4. In the new code of laws, which I suppose it will be necessary for you to make, I was off um, creating a new country in Philadelphia. We now know the extent of a crime called battering. We know that there are tremendous numbers of women of all ages who had need help, not just from husbands or lovers or friends, but from their own children because we've become such a violent society. But today, we have in this country over 1,000 rape crisis clinics and shelters for battered Marietta, Oklahoma straddles Interstate 35, just across the Red River from Texas, midway between Dallas and Oklahoma City. Next Tuesday's election has stirred up a lot of interest here at the Love County Courthouse. The county election board has already signed up four times the normal number of new voters, and twice as many voters have already cast absentee ballots. And all the interest seems to be geared towards one major question, should Love County allow paramutual betting on horse racing? This is the heart of horse country. Thoroughbreds and quarter horses bred here have run with the best at places like Riodoso and Hot Springs. Many of those breeders would now like to bring their horses home to race. A month ago, Oklahoma voters said each county had the option of allowing pair mutual betting on horse racing. A lot of Love County voters would like to exercise that option. This is a, a great opportunity for Love County. Uh, we need the economic boost. We have a, a poverty area here. We need prosperity, and this will bring prosperity. And the only uh, real uh, opposition we have to it is money that's been sent in from outside, and they're appealing through the churches 
uh, and uh, it's just the greed of the people on the outside trying to keep us from having what uh, the people in the community want. Marietta could also be called the buckle of the Bible Belt. Many people would prefer to leave racetrack gambling out of Love County. I'm, I'm against it on moral, for moral reasons. I don't think it's right to gamble. I think it'll bring some jobs, but I think there'll be very low paying jobs, there'll be temporary jobs. Most of them will be filled with uh, possibly uh, uh, illegal aliens because I don't think our people are that hungry. Both proponents and opponents feel a large voter turnout will help their side win. Both say they're confident of victory. Of course, that can't happen, but it looks like the race could have a photo finish. Scott Wallace, Action 4, Love County. candidate George Nye and Republican candidate Tom Daxon. The debate was piped into many living rooms throughout Oklahoma this evening, including this one in Edmond. And according to the man of the house, the televised confrontation helped him make up his mind which way to vote. The debate began. I had not formed an opinion conclusively on the, on the candidates. And I was pretty disappointed in Mr. Nye's answers seemed to be very evasive and did not really come to the point. The Equal Situation Rights Amendment was a subject both candidates were asked nine. to comment on. But I know I was interested in knowing where they stand on ERA because I think that makes a difference on how they look at some other things sometimes. And what did you find out? Well, Daxon says he's against ERA and Governor Nye was, you know, kind of avoided that specifically. Although the Temples are a Republican family, they had not yet made up their minds which way to vote in the upcoming governor's race. Tonight's televised debate helped them decide their favorite. Kevin Ogle, Action 4 in Edmond. Now you had planned on watching the debate. Today, so far, this morning, we have collected uh, 44 units of blood, and that will help us to save over 160 lives. And the girls dress up, and all of the employees here dress up, and we have a really good time on this day. So, our blood drives are real fun. We try to keep them very lighthearted, and so everyone has a good time since they are saving lives. Okay. It is akin to fingerprints in the sense that you take known reference points and compare them to your unknown sample and look to see if the same reference points are there. You can simply say, do the teeth in the plaster cast fit into the impressions in the plaster impression of the person's body that was bitten? Next year, your peak be 
uh, 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 I mean, we may not go back to the kind of regulation we've had in the past, but we may have other policies that will achieve the same goals. You can achieve low interest rates in our country by doing other things besides having uh, the, the, uh, the regulation of interest rates on the liability side. You can achieve economic diversity in the banking business uh, through other methods than uh, the present structure laws that we have, maybe by tougher and more specific antitrust laws. Possibly uh, it's the promotion that helps it. Uh, it's not just the money saving. Of course, that amounts to something, too, you know, when you can save several dollars. But I think it's the promotion that helps. And this is what we're all going to have to do is to promote uh, child safety seats more and to promote the use of seat belts because they are life-saving things and, and we have to let the people know about it. It looks like a scene from the great Waldo Pepper, and it could be. The stuntman on this craft was featured in that performance and countless other Hollywood extravaganzas. 49-year-old Johnny Kaisen of Idaho is a wing walker. He performs breathtaking acrobatics while soaring thousands of feet in the air on top of a 1940 Waco airplane. He jumps and twists and flips wing over wing, but one wrong move, one sudden motion could spell disaster. For 21 years, Johnny has dared to do what most men have never dreamed of. He says it's a labor of love. Oh, we do it for the love of the flying machine. It's a way to make a living with an airplane. Uh, and uh, you have to, as Jimmy said, love this type of work. And the love is the flying machine. We're in the business of selling thrills. You know, people come here to be excited and thrilled with what goes on in the air. She is a real sweetheart. She's just a flying machine. Debbie Mash, Action 4 at Clarence E. Page Airport. The town of Newcastle is celebrating today after officially being de annexed from Oklahoma City. Newcastle residents claimed Oklahoma City would not provide the town with water and that city services to Newcastle, like police and fire, took a long time to respond. One reason is that Newcastle is miles away from Oklahoma City and McLean County. Since 1960, Oklahoma City has collected more than a quarter of a million dollars from Newcastle in taxes, which is why Oklahoma City fought to keep the town of 4200. Newcastle city manager hopes big cities have learned they can't always win. I think it tells all of us in all of our city halls, though, that we have got to provide the services that people pay for and expect. And if Newcastle or, or Oklahoma City, Tulsa, whoever drops the ball, I think there's a new day in town, and that, that, that new decision is that uh, those people can walk and leave us whenever they see it in their best interest. Oklahoma City officials are expected to challenge the Newcastle de-annexation in the state Supreme Court. Since Newcastle doesn't tax its property owners, Oklahoma City thinks the small town won't have enough money to provide good city services. Newcastle residents say they'll take that chance. Ed Stewart, Action 4.
talking about the governor not With winter moving in, some women and children at the city rescue mission have been forced to move out. The mission's heating system doesn't work. It's in desperate need of repair, and it will take $7,000 to replace it, money the mission doesn't have. After Action Force first report about the faulty heaters, help started coming. Volunteers brought in temporary floor heaters to help warm the mission. Bundles of blankets were also assembled to help the women and children brave the cold. The blankets and floor heaters won't effectively warm the mission during the bitter cold months ahead, but it will enable the mission to stay open, and that's a priority. Mickey Callum, the shelter's director, says the women come to the mission as a last resort. For various reasons, they have no money and nowhere to go. Mickey says that's why the mission must stay open. We're in trouble. <laughs> it's cold. It's getting colder. We've got a lot of women. We've got children. We've got people that are depending on us and we got to keep our doors open. And we help them right now. We'll feed them now. We'll give them a place to sleep now. We'll give them clothing now. We'll give them whatever we got, and that's all we can be expected to do. For now, the floor heaters and the blankets will be enough to calm the chill, but they won't be enough during the bitter cold winter months ahead. If you would like to help the city rescue mission, do so by calling 232-2709 or write 523 South Robinson, Oklahoma City, 73109. Debbie Mash, Action 4 at the City Rescue Mission. Oklahomans will be seeing this familiar face for the next four years. George and I and his good guys rolled across Republican challenger Tom Daxon by a two-to-one margin. And the governor had this to say about his sweeping victory. And while I am excited, jubilant, overwhelmed, gratified, appreciative, it's the future of Oklahoma, not the past of this election. The devastated Daxon campaign tried to pull away smiling, saying their time will come. We may not have gotten the most votes in this particular election, but I think one thing is clear. This campaign has spawned a reform movement in Oklahoma, which is going to be heard from for a long time to come. Spencer Bernard, the man with two first names, easily won re-election as lieutenant governor. And I tell you, it's a real rewarding feeling. And another candidate who won easily was Mike Turpin. The 33-year-old Democrat from Muskogee will serve four years as Oklahoma's Attorney General. State Treasurer Leo Winters is back for a fifth term in office. In other election results, the state's congressional delegation will return to Washington intact. All the incumbents were re-elected. The closest race was in the 1st District, where Congressman Jim Jones, the powerful chairman of the House Budget Committee, outdistanced his Republican opponent by 14,000 votes. 5th District Congressman Mickey Edwards, the lone Republican congressman, had no problem sliding to victory. He beat his challenger by nearly 65,000 votes. A lot of people had their eye on the race for the 4th Congressional District. It was expected that freshman Dave McCurdy, the new kid on the block, would have a tough time challenging Republican Howard Rutledge. Rutledge had given McCurdy a tough fight two years ago, but last night was a different story. McCurdy won handily. They may have the dollars. They may have the president on their side, but we've got the people of the 4th District right here. In the 3rd Congressional District, Democrat Wes Watkins is the winner. In the 2nd District, Democrat Mike Sinar. In the 6th, Glenn English wins. The state questions on the ballots were all losers, including a controversial water bond proposal. Many people feared it would give the legislature too much power to give away money to city and local governments to improve their water systems. A plan to redraw legislative boundaries also went down to defeat. If it had passed, congressional districts would have ended up looking like they did in the 1970s. 
And then there was the question that would have raised the debt limit on bond issues, and it would have reduced the vote needed to pass a bond issue. But here's a state question that had passed earlier. In September, Oklahomans legalized paramutual racing. And last night, residents in Love County became the first voters in Oklahoma to approve the legalized gambling on horse races. And if you're wondering about we the shape of the legislature, clash, Republicans gained four seats in the Senate but lost three in the House. The next time voters will have to worry about all this is November 1984. Then Oklahomans will be deciding on a U.S. Senator, all the congressmen, and a U.S. President. Bella Shaw, Action 4. With more and more people filing for unemployment, hope for finding a good job has only become a dream for thousands. It doesn't take long for unemployment benefits to run out, and when that happens, men and women start turning to the armed forces. Military recruiters from all branches of service are swearing in people every day. Men and women who before the economy took a turn for the worse never considered the armed forces. If a jobless person meets the age and educational requirements, there's a better than good chance he or she can be enlisted. I state your full name. Larry Edwin Jones. Jim Davis. You solemnly swear. Do you solemnly swear. swear. For Oklahoma recruiting offices, things couldn't be better. Even though the jobless rate is higher in other parts of the country, all recruiting offices in the Sooner State are surpassing the quota of new recruits they want. Because of the sudden rush to join the service, recruiters say they can be more picky. We, in fact, do turn away uh, people. Uh, we can't afford to uh, turn some away, and we'll go for the quality and, uh, and still get the, the numbers we need also. Recruiters are still giving the usual selling pitch to people interested in becoming part of the military. However, since more service people are still leery of the economy, the reenlistment numbers are making a recruiter's job much easier. Uh, we're finding now that uh, once people are getting in and finding out what benefits and entitlements that we've got and taking advantage of it, that they can't really uh, turn it down. They can't find other companies and organizations that offer the same kind of benefits uh, the same entitlements, and, and be as easy to obtain, maybe. Unemployed people are not promised paradise after they enlist, but they do receive the work the private sector didn't provide. Servicemen and women won't get rich in the armed forces. However, for many, the military training could make job hunting less of a battle once back in civilian life. Ed Stewart, Action 4. State Bureau of Narcotics. The OSBI stormed this office about 3 o'clock yesterday afternoon, confiscating financial documents at the request of Governor George Nye. Apparently, Nye was tipped off that certain funds within the department were being mishandled. Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs Director Warren Henderson voluntarily has taken leave of his post until the investigation can be completed. According to the governor's press secretary, John Reed, the probe stems from fiscal matters within the management of that department. The indications are that the investigation will last between two and three weeks. Uh, once that is completed by the OSBI, the information is transferred to the governor. The governor reviews it, and as a policy, he then forwards it on to the uh, district attorney, appropriate district attorney. And uh, in this case, it looks like that would be uh, Mr. Macy here in Oklahoma City.
most of uh, the reductions in, in sales tax can be attributed to the reduction in the demand for oil. And consequently, national policy gets into this. And uh, uh, I think Employment Security uh, Commission has been making some estimates and, uh, and do not foresee a, a turnaround in the Oklahoma economy before spring. And uh, so, so that's, uh, that's a We believe that the people who committed the crime have an associate in central Oklahoma who has enough knowledge of this crime to, one, collect themselves a very sizable reward, and two, help us with the arrest.